We are coming to an end of a series, and we're now left with the title, The One and Wisdom. And we're going to continue to explore this idea of Platonic thought and the idea of the one. In order to do so, let's cover, recover a couple of points. The idea of the one or the good is the ultimate term. And tonight we're going to explore how you can talk about the one and wisdom. In our last talk, we talked about how these ideas are part and parcel of the nature of reality and any spiritual endeavor necessarily involves those kinds of things and therefore they are the conditions and the nature of reality and the spiritual evolution of man that exist prior to his activity and therefore in that sense they're timeless and in that respect they can be talked about as the perfecting qualities and that's the name for them by the way the perfecting qualities or excellences Now, we're on another search. We want to see how we can use this idea of wisdom and the idea of the one. And I'm sure a good number of you are already seeing, good heavens, ahead of time, that if all of these are in place and you match them with your own integrity and way of being, then it necessarily follows that you'll reach the goal. Therefore, in a simple sense, in the simplest sense, in a popular sense, we can say knowing how to pursue and understanding that pursuit is a kind of wisdom. Not wisdom, it's a kind of wisdom. So we'll leave that for a moment and go along. Now, we have to talk about how you can go from the idea of the good or the one to the idea of wisdom. How does one fit with the other? So therefore, we're going to go through a kind of metaphysical cosmology. What do I mean by that? Just as the Genesis talks about God creating the universe through seven stages or six working days and one day off, at each point he does something. So we have a metaphysical unfoldment, a metaphysical unfoldment that is the very condition, the very condition for the physical creation. It's prior to it, however, and that's what we want to look at. So how can we make sense of this rather peculiar statement I just made? Well, here we go. The idea of the one, or the good, primary term. The next idea from the good or the one, next idea, that is to say, let's see how you can get the next two ideas. Given the best understanding of this, what terms would you say comes closest to representing that? Oneness. That's what these are. What? Uh, oneness. Hmm. Might be. But there are another set of terms. All right. And the first is bound or limited. Bound. Or limited and the unlimited. Sometimes this is called the infinite. And the two things you can say. Limited, bound, infinite. This is like the first statement you can make about it. Now, why don't we use one many, same, other, like, 
unlike. Why don't we do that? Because one in many is the appropriate language to use to describe number. For all numbers composed of one and many. But bound in infinite is continuous. Continuous as some. It's continuous. Infinite. And that's what it is, bound. Therefore, these terms have a greater scope, less limited than one and many. Same and other. Same presupposes that well, there must be two things you're talking about that has some commonness between them, and therefore it's a derived idea from two things that already exist. Same thing with other. Like and unlike, same thing. Therefore, the more primitive terms, the more fundamental terms, are bound and infinite. So if the one, notice the way we can talk now, if one, the ultimate term, the next thing we can say about it is bound and infinite. Now, bound and infinite, infinite, another term to understand that can be a vast power. And Plato and Proclus and other people, they talk about this, therefore, as the source of light, the luminosity, that extends itself through all generative orders. Right? It extends itself through all orders. And we have to talk about what we mean by an order in a moment, and we'll easily do that for you, but just hold fast. On the other side, bound. You know, once anything is bound, then you set a limit to it. By that very act of in some way binding it, you are then limiting it. It entails, therefore, a boundary. Therefore, it necessarily entails something, which is to say, at that moment, you delimit it. You put a limit around it. Right? Now you can talk about it. So it measures, in that sense, it measures and defines. So built into the structure of the nature of reality from the idea of the one is the idea of bound. What does it do? It limits, right? It limits. Right? Once you limit something, therefore it, you can talk about it as something that is. It measures it in that sense and defines it within that scope. So these are the two primary ideas. Now, you know what's interesting about this? Is that... The third idea comes into play when Plato says these two primary ideas, bound and infinite, come together and mix. This is the mix. Right. They come together and they mix. That mix is being. That's the origin of being. Spelt with a capital B. Now that's rather curious. That mixed now becomes therefore and it carries with it, it carries with it vast power, right? And also measures and defines, and therefore the very possibility of things being a multiple and creative, etc., proceeds directly from the very core of its being. So that's being. Now look here, any time you have anything that mixes and these two things come together and are mixed, well, three things you can say about any mixture. Three things. Right. One, the easiest thing to say is, you know what you've got? You've got, you have to have, in a really, see, if the mixture is perfect, necessarily, you've got beauty. You've got truth. You've got symmetry. So therefore, these, therefore, are the three ideas you must necessarily use when you're talking about being. 
Another word for being, reality, in the highest sense, reality, nature of reality. Pardon me? How about balance? Balance? Symmetry. Is that the same symmetry? as symmetry? Balance, balance proceeds from symmetry. It doesn't cause symmetry, right? It proceeds from it. So symmetry is a more fundamental term. Now, what do you get with symmetry? See, when you get symmetry, symmetry is a very interesting concept. Symmetry, therefore, presupposes there are two things. Two things. And when they're present, you have symmetry. Union and communion. Huh? Union and communion, the very basic notions of symmetry. Bring the very idea of symmetry, when two things are symmetrical, or anything is symmetrical, therefore you're talking about a unity of them, if there's a union must be, and then the parts in some way can inter interpenetrate, and that is communion. Now, Truth, in this sense, you see, uh, truth means that it came, it came into, it came, this being can be regarded, the mixture can be regarded as, as truth, because um, another word for truth, of course, is not forgetting, it's, it's true, it's, it's what's there. But what's better than that, it is that it is the cause, it is the cause Truth is the cause of what we call here reality, cause of reality and existence in Plato, right? Just as the cause of union and communion is symmetry. And beauty, as you all know, right? If something is beautiful to the degree that you perceive it as beautiful, you're seeing that it's very, in its very nature, it's intelligible. Therefore, the primary, the primary being is intelligible, it exists, right? and it permits and allows necessarily a union with it that is community, which is a communion, which means a interpenetration, which therefore follows that there must allow participation in it. Therefore, we live in a universe in which participation on the highest level is possible, which means then man then can achieve union with it, and therefore it's a kind of communion with it. Right? As a result of that, one then can recognize existence and reality in that participation, and you recognize, therefore, and it must be, that it's a vast intelligibility. Therefore, the nature of ultimate reality is intelligible, it's true in the sense that it is real, it's the highest reality, and it allows a participation through union and communion. Now what I'm doing here is bringing together a Platonic sequence of thought. Now, another aspect, another aspect of power, which I wonder whether I should bring it in. I'll bring it in, okay. See, light in Plato is not this light, visible light, it's luminosity. Right? Power of luminosity. And it proceeds through all the stages of creation and all stages of development from that point on. Now, what can we do with this? All right, what can we do with all this? Well, we can talk about these three terms not just in terms of ultimate reality, we can talk about these three terms in the everyday world. And that's what we're gonna do, we're gonna shift from ultimate reality to the everyday world. When you encounter beauty, right, what does it do for you? Consider, right? um, suppose you come upon something beautiful quite unexpectedly. What does it do to you? Benefits. Benefits? Might, but the experience itself does what to you? Attracts. You turn back upon yourself. Oh! 
<laughs> Astonishment, right? You're brought back to yourself. In that sense, it brings you together. It unites you. And it propels you towards that thing which you find beautiful. And it also drives you towards the center, your own center. Because it hits you most centrally, as well as whatever it is you perceive and grasp as, an, as beautiful. You want to become part of it through, it through whatever it's going to be considered as its most centered. Right? So that's how beauty affects us in the everyday world. And therefore, it reaches all the way down. This idea of metaphysical beauty goes all the way down into the visible world. And we're astonished when we see it. And it's most visible and apprehendable through the sense of sight. Or some people gain it also through hearing, but principally sight. Now, truth in the visible universe, in our everyday world, takes on the name of justice. Because whenever you say something is true, that means you must be relating it to something. Right? You're relating it to something. And you're saying that relationship is true. Often, therefore, the I behind the idea of truth is model copy. The integrity, the integrity between model and copy, truth. That's a controlling thing. It regulates. Truth, therefore, is a kind of thing of regulative. And necessarily, it improves. Necessarily. Right? But it's difficult to grasp in the everyday world, because most copies of justice are contained with all kinds of reasons why you might say there's a little bit of injustice and a little bit of justice, and it causes us to wonder. We're not astonished, that is to say, when we grasp justice as we are when we grasp beauty in the everyday world. What is symmetry now in the everyday world? That's the same thing here as justice, as truth, with a difference, right? The integrity between the form and matter, right? it's whatever is here to the degree that it is there, to the degree that it is there, harmoniously, symmetry. With one added dimension, right? It, it, always, it always, the form being more intelligible, is that which dominates over matter. And to that degree, its imposition of order and form is another sense of the way in which we can talk about symmetry. Now, we're going to use this. We're going to use this, right? in this way. We're going to talk about these things in terms of man's experience. So that's what we're going to do. Right. Certainly, what we'd like to see is, is it possible to talk about someone who has to the same object, to the same single object, These three things? Is it possible that they, we might be able to find some kind of thing which is beautiful, which exhibits truth and justice as we just described, and has the properties of symmetry in the same in which we just mentioned, especially the better dominating the worse? Well, I want to look at this for a moment. And uh, to do that, we need to do one more thing. All right? OK, here we go. We're going to keep what we have. I'm going to let these pass for a moment. Now, what this means, therefore, is the good of the one, by this process, brings into existence the idea of being. Therefore, we can talk about the relationship between the one and being as being 
is the offspring of the good. And it's held in honor, right? Held in honor. Therefore, the one in this sense, metaphysically, is then the cause of being or reality. Now, what we want to review for a moment would be, remember the question we had here, that's what we're working on. Is it possible to participate, to experience this ultimate reality? How would you do it? What do you need to do it? Well, if you were to experience it, one thing would be clear, and that is, it would be an overwhelming experience of pure beauty, called the perfection of beauty. Right? This experience by this person then takes on the name the perfection of beauty. If the person, therefore, using the language we were using before, participates in it, then there is a union with it, a communion with it, and to that degree, it must be that in the very nature of man, there must be something that allows this, and that is that he shares an ultimate reality, and therefore, in this kind of a vision, which can only be experienced in Plato, by the mind only, only the mind, nothing else. It's mind only experience. It's called the perfection of beauty. And so long as someone contemplates this, abides in that, to that degree they're participating then in the kind of uh, way of being which clearly unfolds the reason for man's existence in terms of Plato. This is all, everything I'm saying at this point comes out of the symposium. Now, look here. What is it, therefore, the person experiences while the effect is pure beauty, the perfection of beauty? What is it then that he touches? He touches, therefore, reality. He touches reality. Other translations, Rouse, says he touches truth. Now, truth, remember, in this sense, right? truth is the cause of reality in all existence. Truth, reality, and existence fit together, hand in glove. Right? So these are the ideas of the mixture. He then experiences the nature of reality. And experiencing the nature of reality, look here. Experiencing the nature of reality, he now knows truth. Experiences as beauty and recognizes necessarily that he is therefore in union and communion with that which he experienced, which is the nature of reality. Now, look here. Plato says something rather curious about this. And therefore, as someone who encounters this, he says, becomes the friend of God and immortal, if any man ever is, because he's sharing in it, communion with it, means there must be something between the two that is then common. Therefore, in that experience, he recognizes his own divinity. At that rate, at that point in which reality coincides with the divine. Now,
Would you not agree that if such an overwhelming experience, pure beauty, the perfection of beauty, if that ever did occur to our friend here, would you not say that it would awaken a, a passion for the object, a love for the object? Would you not agree the one thing which we all know is that in every culture, wherever we are, this can always be said, right? That love is a desire, right? And love is awakened by beauty. And therefore, the greatest love would be awakened by the most beautiful of all possible objects. And if this experience of the nature of ultimate reality is the most beautiful possible experience for man, then that would awaken in him the greatest love that man can experience. How is it experienced? As the most brilliant light of being, which, however, is not merely luminosity, but numinosity, as uh, Rudolf Otto once said, right? Numinosity, that means at the core of the experience, one recognizes that what you're experiencing is intelligible. The nature of reality is intelligible, not merely beautiful, but intelligible. And in that experience, you recognize that it is essentially, essentially good. Therefore, it shares in goodness necessarily it's intelligible it's known only by the mind therefore it's intelligible that's what the mind is mind only knows that which is intelligible one participates in it an overwhelming experience of beauty called the perfection of beauty one wants it because would you agree just because something is perceived by you to be beautiful you would not be attracted to it at all if you found out it was bad for you bring about your your demise or negative, it has to be good, or you don't want it, even if it is the most beautiful of all things, and therefore the nature of reality must follow then, is goodness. Ah, one, the good. Therefore, this then must take on goodness. One, this must take on the quality of unity. Necessarily must take on the quality of goodness because that's the next, as it were, quality from the nature of the good, and unity follows in a similar way from the one. Therefore, Socrates is not a philosopher. <laughs> there is some reputation that he has gained, which is not proper. He is not at all a philosopher. Looker, looker, looker. Looker, looker. Wisdom, right? Philo, Sophia means the love of wisdom, does it not? Right, necessarily, right, right. Oh, by the way, if you have a love of something, do you lack it? If you love something, is that a desire? Yeah. When you have a desire, is that a desire for something you have or something you lack? lack. No. I think it's for something you have. <laughs> we have a desire but to when you it. have it, do you yeah, love it or are you loving? Hmm? Hmm. Look here. Suppose you met a charming young lady, right? Here she is, nude. <laughs> well, all my figures are nude, don't laugh. Right? If you went up to her and said, my dear, I find you very beautiful, and she would say, of course. <laughs> and if he were to say, I would like to get closer, she might say, why don't you get closer instead of telling me what you want? Would you, well, she's intelligent, she's an intelligent young lady, right? Suppose 
he now is bold and steps forward and says, I want to love you. Suppose she again was so intelligent as to say, why are you wasting your time desiring me when you can have me? Ah, then would you call this an example of desire? Or would you say they are doing it? Doing. <laughs> Therefore, that's called loving, not love then she can then gain the name of the beloved, can she not? Ah. So, so far as he is, he loves, what is he showing? Desire. Desire. Suppose she says at that moment, right? Now what do you think? And he says, well, I love you. Suppose she's intelligent and says, that's rather foolish. <laughs> I mean, you already have me. We're already together in a communion and union. She said, is it likely that you may desire to continue loving what you're doing in the present, in the future? And since you don't have me in the future, you may want me and continue to be with me in the future, and that you ain't got, and therefore you legitimately may desire that which you do not have in the future. Therefore, you can still say you love. Is that right? Now, look here, if any of this is true. Suppose someone came up now to the most beautiful thing. And we'll call her by the name of Sophia. Thank you. Right? Ah, ran out of gas. OK. I was going to use red, but I didn't. it seems to me I ran out of red. Sophia. Right? Wisdom. Now, in the same language, if Socrates then, if we met him and said, hey, Sock, what are you doing? He would say, well, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I desire wisdom. And we would say, good, go for it. Right? Now look here. If we met him later, he might have said, hey, I got real close. What would we say? Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, suppose we met him then sometime later and he were to say, I participated in her. What would we say? Why did she say that? She did. All right, if I caught your meaning. See? Now, at that moment, could Socrates say, I desire Sophia? Not at that moment. Not at that. It would be foolish. Not at that moment. He's doing it. Yeah. Ah, ah. So now we just have a simple story to say. Look here. But, but, but wait a second. In the Apology, the Oracle of Delphi comes and says, He's the wisest person in the world. Now, yeah. And then he yeah. says, well, I thought that's pretty dumb, you know, but then the gods come along, etc. He does all that yes. dancing around. Yes. And he says, the only wisdom I have, I'm paraphrasing yeah. it, yeah. is the fact that I realize I don't have wisdom and all these other people think they're wise. Yes, that's true. And therefore so, I'm not wise in their kind of wisdom. Yes. Yeah, so, but he didn't tell us in what kind of wisdom he is wise in until we get to the symposium. Yeah. Right? He's clever. That guy is very clever. No to wonder they gave him the hemlock. Years <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, how is he not a uh, philosopher? Wait, wait, we're, 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 we're getting close. We're getting close. <laughs> Watch. Getting close now. Would you agree if he experiences this, then one or two things follow? Right? He may want to resume, return to it, get it again, now that he's had it, it once. That happens with lovers. Does it not? And beloveds, once they get in a relationship, they're not satisfied, they want to resume it. And they don't have that, therefore they in fact may may now awaken an even greater love and passion for it. But wait a while. Wait a while. 
Got a problem here. Then would you agree from this story, there's something rather curious. Therefore, you can never call anyone wise or a pure sense sophist. Because from what we're saying, it's a temporary experience that you can enter into and get out of. And therefore, once you get in and out of it, you may want to return to it again and again. And that may therefore bring us to realize that that kind of a person is a lover and therefore deserves the title, a lover of wisdom. Agree? But that means, therefore, there's no one who's called the sophist. For if there was a true sophist, there would be no need to, no need to, no need to. Hmm. That's rather peculiar. Now, <laughs> now look here. Therefore, either Socrates is a philosopher in the sense that he must continually return to it, or if he goes beyond it, and gets into a state that is not episodic, in and out, in and out. If he does get in a state that's higher than this, he's not a lover of this primarily. Let me do it again. Right. He would not be primarily a lover of wisdom if he loved something higher than that. Or if he could be defined in any sense higher than a lover of wisdom. He would only be secondarily a lover of wisdom, but not primarily. Therefore, we want to know whether this title of philosopher describes Socrates primarily. Now we go back into our diagram. Are we lucky we have a diagram? <laughs> oh boy, without chalk, there'd be no philosophy. <laughs> Like her. From our diagram, would you agree? <clears throat> this is called <clears throat> the offspring of the good. Another name for it. It's also called the idea of the good. And we know we have to be careful when we see this word because that's a Greek word, idea, right? We already know that. We should never consider it as this, the thought, the concept, the view. None of these capture what this means. This means, this word means, and it should always be translated this way, to behold the good. Right. To, to behold the good is an experience. That experience is the offspring of the good, and that's why it can be called in capital letters the idea of the good. Therefore, the idea of the good, ultimate reality, beauty, all of these terms can be exchanged. But wait a minute, let me ask you something. <clears throat> Is it ever possible for a man to go to the cause of that? What's the cause of this? The one and the good. The one and the good. Wait a minute. Would it follow if Socrates were to in any way be able to claim this, would that primarily define his being? And therefore, we wouldn't call him by something that he might still enjoy to re-experience, but he wouldn't be defined primarily in terms of that experience. Would you agree? Yeah. Therefore, the whole thing we have to explore is whether or not it's possible to talk about what do you have to do to go from the nature of reality, offspring of the good, idea of the good, all of these words are interchangeable, perfection of beauty, beauty itself, all of these are interchangeable. Is it possible, therefore, 
to find some way in Plato does he make a distinction between these two? Does he say that this is higher than this? Does he say that this is the last of the known things? Then if there is something that can be if there is something then that can be apprehended but not known, it must be the one in the good. Apprehended but not known. Known means there's something about it you can say you know. It is. You've delimited it, measured, defined, described. If those things are not possible to this, the one or the good, then the good or the one is not an object of knowledge but must go beyond it in both dignity and power. Now, in order to make you work, wouldn't you agree? I mean, we often come in here to make you work a little bit. Right. And therefore, I brought something to make you do a little work. All the different translations of Plato have a curious problem. When Plato writes, a ball rolled down the hill, every translator can translate the ball rolled down the hill. Whenever he talks about this, it seems that everybody has an idea of what he means, and every translation is really different. And I have a friend of mine who I've known for some years who's taken on the challenge of really looking at this quote with great care. Now, I, in my miserable poor performance in Greek, have struggled through it several times. But now that I know someone who is much more friendly with the subject and akin to it, he's promised that he is going to talk about it in the near future, and we're going to have a party, and I wish you could all come, because he's going to talk about this one small little paragraph out of Plato's Republic, which I just happen to have made Xeroxes of. So. Now, it's a real curious passage. And um, I'd appreciate it, therefore, if we just quickly pass, take one, pass them back. Okay, now. Here you are, sir. Pass one more back. It's the last paragraph. Any more? You need back a couple, back, couple more? Now, if you please go to the page that has that beautiful figure on it, which is page 315. Here Plato takes that great allegory of the cave in the upper world, and in one paragraph we're going to see this whole problem, which I call the mystery, and we need to take a look at it. So here it is. This is the mystery. And what we want to look at are those key terms in that paragraph, and we'll do it together. And what I'm talking about, first let me give you a quick view of his, this is his reflection on the whole allegory of the cave in the upper world. Then we must apply this image, my dear Glaucon, to all we have been saying. The world of our sight is like the habitation in prison the firelight here is, is to the sunlight here. The ascent and the view of the upper, upper world is the rising of the soul into the world of mind. Put it so and you'll not be far from my own surmise. 
since that is what you want to hear. But uh, God knows if it's really true. At least what appears to me is that in the world of the known, the last of all is the idea of the good. And with what toil to be seen. This must be seen. See, not thought. This must be seen. What's it called? The idea of the good. Can you put experience rather than seen to... Because seen... I know, has to, that visual? Yeah. yeah, yeah, to, yeah. Well, I didn't bring my lobe and I could help you, but next time. Okay, I'll bring the lobe. Take a look at the word. Did you? Good, good, okay. And seen, watch now, and seen, once this is seen, once this is seen, it must be inferred, it must be inferred, right? Watch now. Once seen, it must be inferred to be the cause of all right and beautiful things for all, right? which gives birth to light and the king of light in the world of sight. What does the idea of the good then do? It gives birth to what? It gives birth to light and the king of light. Notice the language. Therefore, what's the queen? Okay, in the visible world there, for the sun and the sunlight, what gives birth to that? What? The idea, the, the idea of the good. This thing, right? It must be inferred to be the cause of the sun and the sunlight in our visible world. The nature of reality, the way in which it unfolds, naturally brings into existence our universe, the sun and sunlight. And in the world of mind, herself, the queen, what does she produce? Truth and? Herself, queen, is that the idea? Yeah. Uh-huh. No, no, no. The queen is called, what does she give to birth? Truth and reason. Truth and reason. That's right. Hey, what's the king? The sun. Look there, two kings and queens. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So it presupposes a royal couple. The king and queen in the world of mind and the king and queen in the world of sight. In the world of sight, what's the king? Sun. Good. And therefore, sunlight would be its companion, and therefore deserve to be called the queen. Agreed? Mm -hmm. All right. In the world of mind, what's the what's the queen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Therefore, what's the king? The good. The good. That's what's behind this paragraph. And I assure you, there are very few people who play with it the way it should be treated. But as I say, I have a colleague of mine who's taken on the challenge to do this artfully. And uh, isn't that true, sir? I hope you do. Yes, yes, yes. Very fortunate. Yes, yes, to have such a friend, and how? Not easy. <laughs> right, right, right. Right, if you had to order one, it'd be tough, tough to get one. Right, okay. Now, have we run into this word before? Yep. Yes, right. And reason, that word, by the way, is mind. Right? That's what you need in order to perceive the very nature of ultimate reality. 
Mind, mind only. only. World of intellect. Yeah, world of intellect. Yeah, yeah. And the intelligible. I don't yeah. get it. Now. <laughs> what? I don't get it. Okay. But if the queen produces truth and reason, yeah. and she is the idea of the good, and the idea Natch. of the good is reality, or Natch. the most brilliant light of being, Natch. why would the most brilliant light of being produce truth? I mean, isn't it truth <coughs> itself? Isn't it mind itself? Oh, look here. Right. See, would you agree the way we were talking about it? This ex when these combine, what did we say about it? Huh? This nature of reality is nothing other than the primary forces brought into existence to produce that idea of the good by the good itself, limit and infinite power, right? That mix contains three things. Any mixture contains three things. What are they? Beauty? Did we find beauty in this? Ah, truth? Necessarily, reality and existence. Symmetry? The necessity for union and communion within itself. Therefore, in the nature of reality, it necessarily follows that there is going to be the, the very conditions for the union with it, communion with it, and when that takes place, you're experiencing the nature of reality and existence in a overwhelming experience of beauty, which you discover is intelligible since you discovered it with the mind only. Therefore, when you recognize this, out of this comes these three things. Now go back to your question. Why does the queen bring forth truth and reason? Yeah, if she right. is truth and reason. Yeah, okay, yeah. See. See, can you find in the nature of reality or the idea of the good certain distinctions, some of which become necessarily the conditions for others? Therefore, can, can we rank what we find in here hierarchically? If so, then some things we're going to have to say follow from it. That's a way of talking about it, isn't it, when we talk about it hierarchically. Therefore, we can say, therefore, the nature of reality, therefore, right, brings forth truth and existence. Take a look at the last couple of lines in Book 6 in Plato's Republic, which we don't have here, but... Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Good class, good class. The high point, the high point. Oh, got, he's got several good high points. The sun, now notice he's going to go back between these two orders, the visible and the world of the mind. I'm on page 308. The sun provides not only the power of being seen for, right? The sun provides not only the power of being seen for things seen, but I think you will agree also their generation, their growth, and their nurture although it is itself not generation, of course not. Similarly with things known. You will agree that the good is not only the cause of their becoming known, but the cause that knowledge exists, it's the cause that knowledge exists. Would you agree if, you, if the highest, last thing to be known, the most important thing to be known is the idea of the good, it, it is the very condition for knowledge. But the cause, a condition that knowledge exists, and of the state of knowledge. Although the good is not itself a state of knowledge, but something transcending far beyond it in both dignity and in power. Right. Right. So, 
far beyond. Answer. Pardon me? And it's like a precursor. Yeah, yeah. Or the conditions for it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now let's go back. If, you t if we then take a look at this, then, how does one proceed from here to here? Now, that's really the high task of the Republic. He spends so much time. See, Plato spends a great deal of time insisting upon and the need for this experience. The idea of the good, the nature of reality, for the perfection of beauty, beauty itself, nature of ultimate reality, all of these things, right? Now, you also agree that as a consequence of the experience, we can make certain distinctions about it. We can talk about it in a certain kind of language because in reflecting upon the very nature of the experience, we can make, we can distinguish, not parts, but we can distinguish and use language to describe the distinctions we make. Now, this is where the dialectic proceeds. The dialectic, therefore, questions whether or not the thing that you regard it as most ultimate is in fact ultimate. It is true it's ultimate reality, but is the ultimate beyond reality? That kind of reflection becomes the very dialogue, inward dialogue, called the dialectic in Plato, book seven, six and seven. <clears throat> right? That dialection, dialectic, therefore, it just hinges on one thing, <clears throat> again and again. If you say this is beauty itself, or the perfection of beauty, you are saying something about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah oh, then it does have qualities you can describe. Yeah, yeah, that's many. Do you say it's also ultimate reality? Yeah, I said it was ultimate. <laughs> experienced as beauty, you called it ultimate reality. How interesting. Oh, do you say, by the way, it's the offspring of the good? Yeah, that's another quality. Is this a pure one, or are you making distinctions in here? Distinctions. If so, a many and not a one. Therefore, the dialectic, therefore, purifies the mind, takes it away of considering this as ultimate, not ultimate reality, is ultimate reality, so that you're left only with the one. What happens? These things then, therefore, <coughs> play a role in the very dialectic and bring one, therefore, to the state, not experience, because an experience you can go in and out of. Right? And if you can go in and out of, it's episodic. But if you then encounter or know what this is, if it's beyond knowledge, right? If it's a state, nothing in it. Therefore, if Socrates reached it, what would you say of him? Could he be? He's out of a job. He's out of a job. <laughs> Therefore, I'm going to offer a new bumper sticker for all philosophers to put at the back of their car. Socrates is not a philosopher. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, <clears throat> Socrates' teacher, Diotima, in the symposium is described not as a philosopher, but as a sophist. Using the word sophist in the highest sense. Therefore, if Socrates went from being Socratic to diatomic, or diatomic, if we can call it that way, <laughs> then he moved from being a philosopher primarily to a sophist. Therefore, he can't be a lover of wisdom. He is wise. A state he doesn't go in and out of at all, and therefore we can then say we've reached the idea of the one and the problem with wisdom, which is you have to stop loving it going beyond it, you might be able to say you are it. <laughs> That's my joke for tonight. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Took you through the ride? That's the end of our series. And so if you have some things you want to ask about, please do so, please. Um, the Gospel of John starts with logos. And is logos the same as the... Uh, 
child of the good, he used some other um, term, term exactly, which was the one which was the term he used when on that side it went to. Uh, it sounds very much the same as all those, essentially. Um, so I'm saying, is, was John in your place? In this? That's what they try to make him out to be, and I've read many or people Or at least who try is that it. statement something which yeah. was used by the Neoplatonists? Yeah. There's a, whole, there's a whole problem about John looked at from a Platonic viewpoint that would, might take us a while to get into, but I can hit some highlights for you. Well, I'm interested just in that yeah, one yeah, yeah, sentence yeah. rather than the rest of John. Anarche, analogos, right? In the yeah. beginning was the word. Yeah. Right. But and the word the, was, it, but the it, logos was with God. Yeah. Dual. Dual. Right. Logos, you see, is uh, represents only the intelligible aspect of ultimate reality. But there's more to the idea of ultimate reality than there is in the idea of the logos. Therefore, the Logos only captures one aspect of it. There's a war, uh, a theoretical war, that very few people get into, but in the Gospel of John, you see, his goal is to try to bring about belief. Now, how does he do it? You see, in the Greek world, Platonic world, something very curious goes on. In the cognitive structure, right, called the divided line. Here you have image thinking, which in our culture would be when you go to a supermarket and grab for something that you've been exposed to on TV and you don't know why you're reaching for that package, you're image thinking. You did that because they imposed on you, in one way or the other, a set of beliefs which you have accepted and didn't know you accepted. This is the realm of opinion, which all Platonists, people want to get out of. To reach understanding, you have to leave it, and knowing. Now, this is called the intelligible. This is called the realm of opinion. Now, the word opinion is doxe, right? right? Belief is pistis, right? Belief, dox, and pistis. What the Christians have done which is very interesting in the Gospel of John, is the whole goal is to make them believe that the Logos is personified as Jesus, personification of the Logos is Jesus. And you have to then believe that that Logos is that historical figure called Jesus. Now, the word opinion is a very interesting word. Another use of it is the word appearance. Right? Opinion, appearance. Now, the major, one of the major problems of the Gospel of John, uh, whether we have time or not, but uh, the great event in the New Testament in the ninth chapter of Gospel of Mark is that fantastic description of the transfiguration of Jesus with Moses and Elijah coming out of the divine luminosity and they have a dialogue. All right, magnificent uh, occasion. Now, this is called doxa. Because another sense of doxa is appearance. It's the appearance of the divine. So they've taken the word opinion, right, treat it as appearance, and the whole problem, the whole, the whole mystery about Christianity is why they don't take this as the crowning achievement of the story of Jesus rather than the crucifixion and the resurrection. Right, that's the whole problem. But in the Gospel of John, you see, he is going to talk, he does not talk about this at all. 
he wants to use this term, doxe, in appearance, for the belief in Jesus as the fulfillment of that belief. So for, for Platonists, therefore, we're looking at this, we're saying, isn't it curious, the Christian structure of thought has taken what is discarded in the Platonic philosophical world and they've honored it by making it the cornerstone of their philosophy. And John takes the highest point in the transfiguration, drops it, and instead switches it so that you then gain, not you don't want to believe this, you want to believe in this, the figure, which then becomes image thinking. But there's a lot more to it. I could say a lot more about it. That's just a, a quick dash into theology. Well, wouldn't a Platonist uh, want to take logos and put it in the upper half of that? I mean, the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, they're trying to force reason into uh, the lower half. Yeah, quite true. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Logos goes up here. Logos is the idea in the mind of God in the moment of creation. Right? That's the logos. Uh, if Socrates and Tima reached this one state, went beyond being philosophers to that, could they be in the body to do that? At the last, the last time they saw him, he was in the body. Uh -huh. No, no. Uh, I, I, uh, I think you mean, was that an out-of-body experience? Is that what you're suggesting or what? This is an out-of-body experience. The, the wisdom yeah. experience. Yeah, yeah. that's an out-of-body experience. Uh -huh. So if that's an out-of-body experience, what would that be? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they didn't leave any uh, notes about that. Hmm. Yeah, maybe just out of your mind. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a joke. Right? <laughs> oh, you, would you, are, then are those conditions that exist prior yeah. to yes. perfecting perfection, would that be logos as well? Or logos that's the condition, something? that's the, the condition, the nature of reality, mm -hmm. right? Which anyone who's on the spiritual path necessarily involves themselves in. And these are called the perfecting. These are the perfecting virtues or qualities in the nature of reality. There are also a set of forms, which are the primary forms to talk about the nature of reality in respect to theoretical ideas. In other words, you talk about, there's a set of forms for existence, right, to talk about anything about existence, and that's uh, unity plurality, right? and um, um, same other, and rest in motion, right? Those terms are primary forms and these are the perfecting forms. These are also called uh, conditions of the nature of reality that exist prior to and therefore they exist in their own right and anything therefore that exists in its own right that's timeless, that has these qualities that are in themselves aspects of goodness are called in the Greek world gods. Okay. Right? gods. That defines, especially in Proclus, gods. Did you, did you say For we want to put personalities on gods, right. but that's a metaphysical idea of gods. Did you, if I think you said last week that, I don't know if it was these conditions that exist prior to the time mm -hmm. was the ones that you call gods, that even if in this existence that we see we, was, we destroyed it, these conditions yeah. would continue, yeah. therefore oh. there would be something brought into being, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. necessarily. Yeah. 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 Put it in another way, um, um, you see, you can even talk about it as being in such a state would these things occur. Huh? If you were in that experience of pure beauty, perfection of beauty, or experience of wisdom, as we described it a moment ago, might that be vitalizing? Uh, would you then turn around and look at it? Uh, would you then move into a higher, because that's what purifying means in the, in the uh, metaphysics, right? You move from a lower to a higher. That's what's different between uh, usia and, and purifying, because uh, conversion or usia uh, turning about doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to a higher, it just means that you're turning about. So turning about and going higher is purification. 
right? To be able to be a, have a stability in that state is, is protection, right? To reach the highest level of that that's possible is perfection. Yeah. And therefore, if you allow it, therefore if someone allows it in that experience, then that allows the maximum possible way of penetrating into a communion with the idea of the good. The nature of reality, wisdom, uh, perfection of beauty, all of these terms are equally usable. So that includes the idea of elevation, right? Yes, yes. If you're talking about purification as elevation, and the highest elevation would be perfection. No. No. Okay. Good. Thank you for joining us.